Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to Antioch Bible Church. And we're about to start our worship time. So just I wanted to welcome not only those who are here in person in the service in the gym here, but also those who are watching, streaming online. Again, welcome this morning. Just to remind you that please uh, fill out your prayer request. For those who are here, please make sure to fill that out and put that in the uh, benevolence boxes. Or you can send it to us online or call the office and give you a prayer request. And uh, again, welcome. And I'll turn over to the worship team to start our worship time. Good morning, Antioch. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning and to worship with real people <laughs> and for our virtual people. We're grateful for all of you. Let's uh, stand and let's open our hearts to what the Lord wants to tell us today through worship. Speak, O oh Lord. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you. so good. We're going to do a medley, and I love medleys, and part of the reason why I love medleys is because you get to take all the parts of the songs you really, really like and put it all in one song. So join me now. Turn your eyes. Turn your eyes upon day. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Let's repeat that. Turn Thank you. 
is so good. You know, uh, as I was praying over, Lord, what, is the, what are the songs you want to do um, this week? And he introduced me to this new song called King of Kings. Well, new to me. It's been around for about a year. But um, this is an incredible song. It took a year to write this song, and three people wrote it. And as you listen and um, to the words, you're going to see that there's the gospel from the time Jesus was born all the way through to the end. It's a beautiful, powerful song. So enjoy. Let the Lord minister to you. God is good. I know uh, Zeke's going to be coming up here. 
Good morning, Antioch. As always, we've got lots of great things ahead, events to join in on, as well as opportunities to serve. Don't forget, October is Pastor Appreciation Month. What a great opportunity to express our gratitude for the leaders God has put in place to shepherd us. We're so excited that Children's Church starts up again today during the 11 o'clock service. If you didn't receive the email Dominique sent out to families, simply message children at abchurch.org to receive more information. We're looking forward to serving your kids while being careful to maintain recommended COVID safety guidelines. If you're a leader of a small group at Antioch, home fellowships, AYM small group, Bible studies, or classes, please contact your ministry leader and let them know if you're still meeting or would like to start meeting again, whether in person or on Zoom, so that we can map out a plan for small groups going forward, because we're excited to get back to growing together. If you're not sure who to contact, just reach out to Jan at the office, jhoward at abchurch.org. Are you passionate about seeing people come to faith in Christ? Would you like to be part of that process? With evangelism now being woven into our weekly Sunday morning sermons, we anticipate the need to have a team of men and women at each service who can be paired up with those making commitments to the Lord. If this sounds like something that you'd be interested in, we've got a training class coming up to equip you for this exciting new ministry that we're calling the Follow-Up Champions Team. Please contact Jan, J. Howard at abchurch.org to get more information. Believe it or not, the holiday season is right around the corner, and with that comes the Blessing Basket Outreach. We provide food for families in need, both Thanksgiving and Christmas, and are collecting monetary donations now. For online giving, be sure to choose the fund titled Missions-Blessing Baskets, or write that on the memo line of your check if you're mailing it to the church office or drop it in the offering box. Antioch, have a great week. All right, good morning again. Uh, I didn't say it before, but my name is Ezekiel Bambolo. I'm the executive director with Antioch Adoptions and also an elder here at church, so welcome again. It's time for us to worship with our tithes and offerings. But before I do that, I have to ask, are there any guests in the house today? Any guests in the worship here today in the gym? We have some guests back there. Welcome, welcome. Thanks so much for being here with us. Uh, as we get into our tithes and offerings, we say we are so pleasant. We're so happy that you're here with your, in your presence here, and please don't feel like a pressure to give anything in the offering, right? We want to get, make sure you're giving God your heart and not your money, but at first, just welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. I hear you. All right. So the ways to give, obviously, we can give online. You can give here. The benevolence boxes are out here as well. Uh, you can give, obviously, through the app. If you, I like to give through the app personally, and you can mail your check-in, all right? Uh, last but not least, uh, I'm going to get off, before I pray for our tithes and offerings, I want to look at this sort of video that's going to come on when I'm done. And it's Double Impact Month with Antioch Adoptions. So I hope you just take some time to see what the video has to say, the message there. But let's pray for our tithes and offering. Father God, we thank you for giving us a chance to come and worship you today. It is a privilege that we get to worship you. It's not an entitlement. And we pray, Lord, that as we sit here now and worship with our tithes and offerings, you provide us more than we can ever imagine. And we pray, Lord, that we give back in a small way what you've given to us over and over and over again, that we would not grow weary of giving back to you. Lord, you know what this church needs to accomplish through your hand. And we pray then that the offering will allow us to do that little piece that we know your word does a whole lot more. So bless our time as we seek to give back to you in the way you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You should start off. So Heather and I met for the first time at a high school youth group, actually. I think we went on our first date maybe... December 28th. Yeah, so a couple months 1997. Yep. Here we go. When I was young, my parents became foster parents. It just really impacted me. There's a lot that 
you have to prepare yourself for as a foster and adoptive parent. It's imperative that kids have permanent homes, a permanent placement. God had just late given me a love for these kids and a heart for them. It was never something that even came up as I was growing up. You know, I met uh, her little brother who was two years old at the time and started to open my eyes and my mind and my heart to, to what adoption is and what it means. When we heard about Antioch, then the first thing we did was prayed, and then we went to an information meeting. We left that excited and ready to jump in. We got licensed. licensed yeah. mm -hmm. And then we got a lot of calls that were hard. Right. Yeah, that's heartbreaking and really hard because you're making a decision and looking at a piece of paper, and they desperately need help. Having Antioch as an intermediate really helped us. Like I said, they're an advocate. We're on the same page, faith, family, what our priorities are, and really help us think through what this means. We're the only agency probably across the whole country that does not charge a single penny for adoption, does not take a penny from the state, but has a primary focus on finding permanency for children out of, out of foster care into adoptive homes. A home is essential and a non-negotiable uh, and foundational to um, a healthy life. There's many kids out there who don't have that, and so... Just never forget, God will equip you for what he's called you to do. Working with Antioch has been uh, a blessing because they are an advocate for us, for our family. As a Christian family, they advocate and support us. And if you understand adoption in America right now, it's actually big business. The average adoption cost is around $42,000. Now that's a private adoption, but that's the average cost. But there's also a discrepancy in the race of children being adopted. Where an African American child, especially an African American boy, would be adopted for about six to eight thousand dollars. However, if there was a blonde haired, blue eyed Caucasian girl, don't be surprised to be charged today's numbers around six to seventy thousand dollars. Why is money exchanging hands at any rate for the life of a, of a child, life of a person, when there are many families willing to bring kids into their homes for no cost? We committed never to take money from the state because we wanted this to be God's work done God's way. They become like family to us. They brought part of our family to us. Mm -hmm. They've been by our side through some of the toughest stuff we've been through, and we love them. I want to encourage you to realize that your partnership with Antioch Adoption is everything short of being heavenly. Not only are we getting kids out of foster care and placing them in permanent forever homes, we're fighting so hard to restore their dignity, to restore their trust in humanity, and know that I'm loved, that I'm blessed, that God has restored me. Someone needs to bring them back to a place of true health, true love. That's what you're doing with Antioch Adoptions, and we welcome you. Can you be a volunteer? Can you be an influence for us in finding us adoptive parents? Being a part of events that we do, or being a part of campaigns. And last but not least, can you be a partner with us by giving to us financially to fill the gaps and needs that we need for this agency? By doing those things, I promise you we will save a huge number of lives that ultimately will end up being lives of destruction. Places that I've been, the faces mine are friends, falling, falling. In though with murky
Amen. Zeke, thank you for uh, showing that video. Great encouragement to us. Amen. Uh, we uh, are so thankful that the Katinas uh, did that worship set for us on our 36 year anniversary. So at the end of service uh, to the table right over here, there's a card if you want to fill it out and say thank you to the Katinas. And also, I'm excited that we have Children's Sunday School today. Uh, I just thank the Lord for that. I, I've, you know, always felt that reopening church is very important. And then that next step is having Children's Sunday School so our uh, families with young children can come. And my son, Theo, is in there today. He just turned five years old, so I'm excited for that. And I uh, want to thank Dominique, who is our children's director, and her team, and all the teachers in there. So give them a round of applause. They might be able to hear. All right. Well, we are in our classic series, and today the topic is wisdom. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 is our main passage. So if you have a Bible, if you could turn there, James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. If you have a phone, you could open up your app, and the passage will also be showed on the screens as well. You may recall in the book of 2 Chronicles, when God appeared to King Solomon and said to him, ask what I shall give you. How would you respond to that if God said, ask what I shall give you? I have a couple things on my bucket list. And one of the things on my bucket list is to have some type of property that has a water view. I love God's creation I love the water view, and as I'm back in the Pacific Northwest, I just look at the homes that have views of the water, and I'm like, man, I can't afford that. <laughs> but, Lord, even if it was like a 600-square-foot type of thing with a water view, that would be outstanding. One of the other things on my bucket list is to go to Japan because I'm part Japanese, and so I hope my Uncle Al Vallette will take me to Japan one day. Amen? Just a little encouragement. I also want to go to Israel. I haven't been to Israel, too, so that's, uh, I'm just sharing all my hopes and desires with you guys today. Uh, but so if God said, Herb, ask what I shall give you, I'm going to be honest, the first thing that might come to my mind is that house with a water view. Oh, man, I would just love to have it and just to look out on the water and to enjoy God's creation. Some of you may ask for $10 million. Because if you had $10 million, you would never have to work another day in your life. Some of the more spiritual people in here might ask for a revival in the Pacific Northwest to see millions saved in the Pacific Northwest. That is certainly a, a vision that I have for our church. Some of you who never want to die, you might say, God, I want a guaranteed rapture. I want to be raptured so I never have to experience earthly death. And so this question was proposed to King Solomon. Ask what I shall give you. And King Solomon asked for wisdom and knowledge. Out of all the things, wisdom and knowledge to govern God's people. The book of Proverbs says this, at least in two different places. It says that wisdom is better than jewels. 
and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Today, we will learn about the wisdom of God. Let's read together James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James opens with a question in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? And I think wisdom has to do with the tongue because James chapter 3 verses 1 through 12, James spent 12 verses writing about the tongue prior to writing six verses about wisdom. Those who bridle their tongue and who restrain their words are wise. But it says, who is wise and understanding among you? I don't want you to confuse knowledge and wisdom. There is a great deal of knowledge in the world. All the advances of technology, all these great businesses, there is so much knowledge in the world, but there is not much wisdom in the world. The reason why there is not much wisdom in the world is because the world has turned its back on God. Our family has had many doctors who have helped us navigate my oldest son's medical challenges. And there's one doctor who has been incredibly special to our family. This doctor is intelligent, has so much knowledge, and he's a leader in his field. And I asked him one day, I said, do you know the Lord? He responded simply, I don't believe in miracles. I believe in science. This doctor has, wis has knowledge, but he does not have wisdom. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you must have salvation to be on the spectrum of wisdom. Also in verse 13, you see the word meekness. And I don't want you to confuse weakness with meekness. James says that the wise person will show his works in the meekness of wisdom. And meekness is related to humility and having a gentle spirit. The book of Numbers describes Moses as the meekest man on the face of the earth. Strong leaders are meek. They are not weak. Here's a definition of meekness. 
Meekness is equivalent to a stallion at full gallop who immediately stands at attention when the master calls. The wisdom of the world cannot be confused with the wisdom of God. So what we're going to do is we're going to read verses 14 through 16, which describes the wisdom from below. And verses 17 through 18 describes the wisdom from above. So let's take a look at verses 14 through 16 again. It says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. Do you have anything against anyone in this room right now? Do you have anything against anyone who attends Antioch Bible Church? If you do, James says, keep your mouth shut. Do not boast in your arrogance and be false to the gospel because that is not a standard of God's wisdom. Verse 15, it says, this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. James makes it clear that Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, if we have those attitudes, they are demonic. It reminds me of James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. We do not need to have this demonic type of division in our church. Verse 16 for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. I'm a huge unity guy. I told the staff from day one, our top priority as a staff needs to be unity. And also in the church, that's like the top priority. I mean, there's a lot of top priorities, right? Evangelism discipleship, but unity are among the top. So we can't have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition at our church, and that shouldn't be exhibited among Christians. We must guard our hearts. Think of Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel. Bitter jealousy has always been in the heart of man. Because Cain killed his brother because he was jealous of his offering. Think about Genesis chapter 11. The selfish ambition of man to build a tower that could reach the heavens to make a name for themselves. And God confused their language and called that place Babel. Selfish ambition has always been in the heart of man. We must guard our hearts against this demonic wisdom from below. When I was young, my Japanese grandmother told me, she called me Herbie. That was my name, I guess, before I came Herb. She said, Herbie, you sell fish. And, you know, English was her second language. But she was clearly articulating the truth to me at a young age. You sell fish. But through the gospel, God has brought me a mighty long way. I'm still under construction. But God has redeemed my ego for his glory. I don't know if that's happened for you, but that has happened for me. 
I see some young people in the audience. When I was young, I was so into myself. My youth pastor said, so you think the world revolves around you? I said, what are you talking about? But God changes our desires. When we surrender our life to him, our desires change from pride to humility. They change from everything being about ourselves to things being about other people. And humility to me is one of the most attractive traits that a person can possess. If you are humble, I like you. If you aren't, well, we can, you know, work on that relationship. But humility is so attractive. Here's a test, one question of your humility. Does it bring you joy to see others succeed? Are you happy when other people succeed, even when you're trying to succeed, and maybe the blessing hasn't come to you yet, but someone else is blessed? Does that bring you joy? One of my heroes is Billy Graham. Does anyone in here like Billy Graham? Oh, man, Billy Graham one of the true greatest of all time men of God in our era. I love Billy Graham for many reasons. One, he was a passionate evangelist. Under his ministry, so many people got saved. I also love Billy Graham because he was a man of integrity. He protected himself from moral failure. He was a man who was very careful not to be alone with another woman who was not his wife. I also admire Billy Graham for his humility. This is what Billy Graham said. I cringe when I hear my name called in something that has been the work of God through these years. Billy would cringe when people would give him these long, flattering introductions. And when people praised Billy Graham, he gave all the credit to God. A man in an elevator once said, Billy Graham, you are a great man. Billy responded, no. I'm not a great man. I just have a great message. A colleague once told him, Billy, you have always been humble before God and man. Billy replied, I'm not as humble as you think I am. There is always opportunity for bitter jealousy and selfish ambition among Christians. And we see that verse 15 says that it's unspiritual, it's earthly, and demonic. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are devilish. And we cannot allow self-seeking or jealousy to have a place at Antioch Bible Church. We must lay deep foundations of humility in our own lives. So we all have a responsibility to go to God and to ask him to grow us in humility. And that will result in church unity. A church has unity when there is no jealousy, when there is no selfish ambition, when those demonic traits are considered dung, when you have a funeral for jealousy and selfish ambition, then you have church unity. 
Turn your Bibles to the left just a little bit, to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And keep your finger in James. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 is one of my favorite Bible verses, especially verses 3 and 4. But I also want to start from verse 1 because it talks about church unity. Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, it says this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind. Having the same love. Being in full accord and of one mind. Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Verse 4 is so powerful, looking not to our own interest, but also to the interest of others. So as we transition away from this earthly wisdom, we must not take the bait of jealousy and selfish ambition. Again, if you have anything against anyone here, or if you have anything against anyone in the first service, We must not take that bait. We must be united in Christ and we must treasure the wisdom from above. Let's take a look at James chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. And James 3, 17 through 18 really shows us what wisdom from God looks like. It says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we see God's wisdom throughout the entire Bible. In the Old Testament, there are 39 books. In the New Testament, there are 27 books, which totals 66 books in the entire canon. The Old Testament has five books that are referred to as wisdom literature. That is Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Let me break this down really quick because the Old Testament can be overwhelming and hard to understand. So I want you to remember this. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. Five, I don't have much rhythm. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. 5, 12, 5, 5, 12. So what that means is there are five books of the law. And then there are 12 books of history. And then there are five books of wisdom. And then there are five books that are considered major prophets, and then 12 minor prophets. So that's how the Old Testament is broken down. But you have those five books of wisdom. So Christians, some Christians say, well, I don't read the Old Testament because that doesn't apply to me today. 
And some Christians go to far, as far to say, I only read the red letters. Because those are the words that Jesus actually spoke. Well, let me tell you, in the whole 66 books of the Bible, Jesus spoke each and every word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed from God. So Christians who neglect the Old Testament, they are neglecting God's wisdom. And the Old Testament is 75% of the Bible. It is not wise to neglect 75% of God's perfect word. Here's a really good Bible reading plan. The book of Proverbs. I love the book of Proverbs and it's a book of wisdom. You will gain so much wisdom. There's all these punchlines in Proverbs. It's practical. It's easy to understand. So you may say, hey, I want to read the Bible today, but I'm not really sure what I should read. I don't have a Bible reading plan. Well, there are 31 chapters in Proverbs, and there are 31 days or 30 days in a month. So whatever day it is, you can read that proverb. So for example, you're like, I want to get in my word today, but where do I start in this big book? Well, today's October 18th. You could read Proverbs chapter 18. And I've done that many of times. And I'll do that in the future. I might not know where I want to go in the word. And I'll look at the day, day of the month and I'll read that proverb. And if you're consistent with that, you will gain in the wisdom of God. As we look at verse 17 we see seven standards of God's wisdom. And as we walk through these standards of wisdom, it's a list, but I don't want it to be an academic exercise. I want this to be practical. I want these seven standards of wisdom to mean something to you. So as we walk through these seven standards of wisdom, we'll answer two questions, and I want you to keep these questions in mind. Number one, who is God? And number two, what does God want me to do? Who is God, and what does God want me to do? So we see the first standard of God's wisdom is pure. Who is God? Well, this makes me think of the purity of Jesus Christ. The wisdom of God is pure from every fault. It's impeccable, flawless without sin. Did you know in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says that Jesus Christ is our wisdom? And one thing that James does is he echoes his big brother, Jesus Christ. And James particularly likes what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. The book of James is like a commentary to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, we see the echo of pure. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. What does God want me to do? Well, is your heart pure? Are you harboring any jealousy or do you have this selfish ambition? Or do you have a pure heart before God. The second standard of wisdom that we read in verse 17 is peaceable. Who is God? 
Well, Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And Jesus has brought us reconciliation of peace through his blood on the cross. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Again, you see the echo, or you hear that echo. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. What does God want me to do? Do you display the fruit of peace in your relationships? Are you a person of reconciliation and peace? Third, in verse 17, we see gentle. And I underlined that in my Bible. Who is God? Well, God is a gentle father. God is not a cosmic bully who is out to get you. Don't think that God wants to punish you for every little sin that you do. God loves you. And God does not even force you to love him. He gives you a choice. It's a choice for you to be here today. It's a choice if you want to hear the words that I say. And it's a choice if you want to leave here and apply those words to your life. And the word here doesn't mean gentleness like the fruit of the Spirit, but it means more to be equitable and fair. What does God want me to do? Well, do you treat everyone fairly? Do you treat people with equity. Then the fourth standard of wisdom we see is open to reason. God has reasoned with us. He has sent his one and only son to die on the cross for us. God has reasoned with us by allowing Jesus Christ to take our place Jesus is our substitution. And being open to reason means that we are willing to obey the truth. What does God want me to do? Do you obey the truth when it seems inconvenient? I was talking with my wife this morning, and we saw the video on Antioch adoptions. My wife asked me, did I have any friends in high school who got pregnant and had a child? And I said, yes. There was one young lady who I was very close to. And I was telling my wife that I would be slow to pass judgment on teenagers who carry a baby. Because I would imagine a lot of those teenage pregnancies lead to abortion. And my wife said, well, I, I wish more people would look at adoption as an option. And I totally agree with her. And I'm so thankful for those young women who have carried their baby to full term and who have raised them or have given them up for adoption to a family who could better take care of them. Do you obey the scripture when it seems inconvenient? Are you open to reason? Then we see full of mercy and good fruits as a standard of wisdom we're getting a two for one here. So the cross is a picture of both grace and mercy. Because isn't grace us getting something that we don't deserve? So we get salvation that we don't deserve. God shows us grace on the cross. 
And then on the other side is mercy. And isn't mercy withholding punishment for something that we do deserve? So in God's mercy, he sent Jesus Christ to absorb our wrath. He had mercy on us. So instead of us paying the punishment of our sins, God withheld that and showed mercy through Jesus Christ. And again, the echo from Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, what does God want me to do? When is the last time you showed mercy to someone? When is the last time you had compassion on the afflicted? I know James talks about that in James chapter 1, verse 27. It says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. What does God want me to do? Are you loving the least of these? Are you loving those who are oppressed and needy? And then we have two standards of wisdom left impartial. We saw in James chapter 2 verses 1 through 13 that God shows no partiality. God does not have favorites. No matter your wealth, no matter the color of your skin, it doesn't matter. Your political affiliation, God treats everyone with impartiality. Everyone is a 10 in the eyes of God. And so can we have that same heart? If we do, unity in our church will occur. Now, everyone is a 10 in the eyes of God. God does not look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. But I want to be clear that this does not imply the false belief of universalism, which states that everyone will go to heaven. No, everyone will be judged by an impartial God. And everyone will receive an impartial verdict. What does God want me to do? Well, how can you grow to become more impartial in your relationships? And there's no need to be offended by partiality or impartiality. Let's be like Jesus. You might say, well, hey, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not partial. Well, hey, don't be defensive about it. It's good. I'm, I'm glad that you're impartial. But can't we grow to become more impartial? Certainly there is room for growth when we measure ourselves to Jesus Christ. And the last standard of wisdom we see is sincere. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. Who is God? Well, Hebrews 6, 18 says it's impossible for God to lie. God is sincere. And this word is derived from a Greek word that means without hypocrisy. Greek actors who played multiple roles in a play, they changed their mask. And the actors who changed their mask were called the hypocrite because they put on different masks. What does God want me to do? Well, how can you avoid wearing a mask. No pun intended on that. Please wear a mask at church. I want everyone to be safe. But let's not wear a mask of hypocrisy. So verse 18, as we 
get ready to close out the sermon today. It says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. There will be relational harmony among Christians if we follow God's wisdom. But if we follow the wisdom from below, the wisdom from earth, there will be disorder and every type of evil practice. So it's on you. The ball's in your court. If our church is going to be a church of unity, we all must take personal responsibility to lay down deep foundations of humility. I can't do that for you. I got enough to do with right here. I'm working on this humility. As I work on mine, can you work on yours? As we become more humble, we will be the church that God wants us to be. There will not be disorder and there will not be division. And I want to close with James chapter 1, verse 5. You can just flip a page. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him if you lack wisdom god is a generous father and he will give you the wisdom that you need whatever circumstance you're going through you can have the wisdom of god and god's wisdom will line up with the standards that he outlined god loves you god loves our church and i'm just so thankful to be a child of God. Amen? Amen. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for your word. Lord, that is so good every time we get in it. And Lord, I'm just so excited to be the mailman, to be the messenger boy of your word. And Lord, in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never repented of your sins and your pride, then you are not even on the spectrum of wisdom. But God has provided a sacrifice, a substitution for you, his son, Jesus Christ. And when you are judged by God, one thing will matter. Did you believe in my son, Jesus? If you have never put your faith in him, you can right now. Talk to God right where you are. Say, God, I need you today. I turn from my sin so that I can have a relationship with you. Lord, thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. With every head bowed and eye closed and everyone on live stream, if you just said that prayer, you have just begun the journey of wisdom. With no one looking around, if, if you invited Jesus Christ in your life for the very first time, just raise your hand right where you are. Is there anyone in here who said for the very first time today, I invited Christ in my life? Is there anyone on live stream for the very first time, you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. Well, if you did, we want to help you grow in your faith. Just go to the homepage of our website and click on salvation and write us a note so we can help you grow in your faith. Lord, it's so amazing. It's such a privilege to know you. And 
thank you for the opportunity to continually present the gospel. Lord, because we are expecting a harvest. A harvest of righteousness. Lord, we want to be people who bring the peace of the gospel. And so, Lord, continue to stir the believers' hearts who are here, who are watching for their friends who are not saved. Lord, burden us for their salvation. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for making church a priority and coming here. Thank you so much for watching on live stream. Um, it's just God's word is so encouraging. Let's stay in his word throughout the week. I love you guys. You are dismissed. Thank you so much. Have a great week.